How many of you watch nature documentaries? If you have, I'm pretty sure that at least one, you have seen at least one scene where a large predator appears as the villain. Maybe, if you're lucky, you might have seen the predator as the protagonist of the narrative. But there is one untold chapter in this age-old conflict between hunter and hunted, and it is the most important story of all. It's the story from the perspective of the entire ecosystem. Simply put, ecosystems are controlled from the top down with predators acting as the linchpins and gears. Without them, these ecosystems would gradually become impoverished. One poet got the message before most other people did. In his poem, The Bloody Fire, Robinson Jeffers acknowledged the role of violence in shaping our world. The very first examples he uses involve the arms race between predator and prey. Predation is one of the most important of all evolutionary forces and a major cause behind the diversity of life on Earth. But the predator's fangs only begin to gauge the full force of its bite. The fear of those fangs is an even more potent force on its own. It, the fear can influence where animals will be and how they behave simply because they are afraid of being eaten. This makes predators the unwitting guardians of their habitats. Perhaps the best known example of this phenomenon, which is known as a trophic cascade, happened in Yellowstone National Park. Wolves were eliminated from Yellowstone in the 1930s in a misguided attempt to protect other wildlife. But in the 1990s, wolves were reintroduced, and what happened afterwards is now legendary throughout the scientific community. Soon after the wolves returned, something unexpected began to happen. Young aspen, cottonwood, and willow began to grow. While many causes played a role in the disappearance of these streamside trees, the biggest factor was one no park manager would ever address. It was the overpopulation of elk. Now that one of the top predators was back, the elk were being held back once more. But recent research indicates that while the elk populations did drop, the drop by itself was not significant enough to cause to stop their damage by itself. There was another factor associated with the returning wolves. That factor was fear. Wolf hunting success rate depends greatly on the terrain. Around slopes and around thick vegetation, herbivorous animals cannot gain enough pee to evade the wolves. It is therefore advantageous for the prey to keep visits to rivers short and rare, which leaves them with less time to devour the sprouting trees. This change in prey behavior didn't end with the new growth. It had a cascading effect, hence the term trophic cascade. With more trees, more roots held the stream together, reducing erosion. The growth of plant cover combined with the rise in insect populations allowed bird populations to increase. Beavers also benefited from the newly emerging willow stand, and their dams created habitat for more species. To influence the wolves has been a highly polarized topic, mostly due to prejudice from hunters and ranchers, and it's often understated or even downright denied even today. Part of this is that ecosystems are complex things, and so scientists criticize an emphasis on any individual factor over another. But it still remains the case that the wolf is one of the most influential ecological forces in the West. Elsewhere, mountain lions have also have had a similar impact. In Zion National Park, the same researchers who studied Yellowstone's wolf cascade have also found evidence of pumas doing the same. In Zion Canyon itself, where pumas have been eliminated, the population density of deer is unnaturally high, and many are showing signs of malnutrition. There are only a few hardy species of vegetation growing, and the riverbanks are barren. In comparison, another canyon within the same park, which is shown on the left, still has a high density of pumas, and there is both a greater density and a greater diversity of, of plant and animal life on the canyon bottom. On the other side of the world, another study shows that trophic cascade can also take place under the water. 
Western Australia has one of the last healthy seagrass plains in the world, and in an, and in an eerie parallel to the Wolf of Yellowstone, tiger sharks in fittingly named Shark Bay are the guardians of these plains and its smallest inhabitants. Dugongs, which are the Pacific relatives of manatees, graze on seagrass, and they can destroy large patches of it. But when tiger sharks are present, they avoid digging into the, in, into the sand to dig out the roots because this makes them vulnerable to shark attack. Not only that, both dugongs and dolphins, as well as sea turtles, uh, desert the shallows where they prefer to eat, instead sticking to deeper waters where they can see sharks coming. In comparison, sea snakes prefer to head the opposite way into the shallows to hide from sharks. When tiger sharks are absent, all the main prey species become evenly spread out. It is the fear of sharks that dictates when and where a given species will eat, meaning that, and this in turn determines the structure of the entire ecosystem. The impact of sharks is even greater on coral reefs. In every single pristine reef that has been sampled by scientists, the biomass of predators is five times the biomass of their prey. It would seem unlikely that such an ecosystem as shown here could ever exist. But there's a simple answer. The lower on the food chain a population is, the faster it replaces itself. Therefore, the prey fish breed faster than the large fish that eat them, and the large fish breed faster than the top predators. This rapid replenishment rate would lead to the prey species take overrunning the reef if not for the fact predators constantly kept them down. It's important to note that the predators are having such an impact on the planet despite the fact we have drastically reduced their numbers. How great would the full influence be if the full set of modern predators was here? That, predator, that full set included the three animals that are shown up, shown up in, on the screen. The favorite tooth cat, the marsupial lion, and a giant carnivorous lizard. We usually don't think of them as modern animals because we don't see them in modern ecosystems anymore. But they are and they belong to in today. The majority of extinct Ice Age animals went ex were killed off by human activities and not because of natural causes as many people assume. They lived in modern ecosystems that are still around and they lived with modern species that are still around, including ourselves. The patterns of extinction the patterns of extinction reveal that natural climate change can't possibly have been the cause behind the most of the extinctions. As seen here, large animals die, die out when humans invade, regardless of whether the climate was changing or not. In fact, many of the animals that should have benefited from a warming climate also went extinct at this time. Furthermore, a large number of supposedly natural changes that have occurred to ecosystems at these times are not thought to have been caused by humans. It doesn't actually take much for even a small human population to have a make a dent in the wildlife population, especially since we do more than just hunt animals. We can also change habitat. Now, you might be wondering, what does this have to do with trophic cascades? Well, because the well, this means that on every continent except Africa and parts of Asia, where megafauna evolved alongside hunters that use spears and fire, none of the ecosystems on land actually have all their necessary components. It leaves many of the herbivores without most of their main predators, which is the setup for trophic cascade. And this time the results are catastrophic. The evolution of large animals worldwide has mostly stopped. There are no forces pushing for further evolution anymore. This comes at the obvious expense of the ecosphere. There will be no replacement in the far future, millions of years from now, for the animals that we are killing up today. Their future ecosystems will be uninspiring, unstable, and prone to collapse. On a more short-term view, the loss of multiple species means that the role of keystone predator falls to only a handful of them meaning the ecosystem as a whole is much less resilient. For example, if North America still had saber tooth cat, the job of controlling bison populations would be much better filled than it is right now. Then again, it could have been worse. We could have lost the few predators that still we still have today, except that things seem headed that way. 
Today, even if some predators are regaining lost ground, anti-predator sentiment is rising once more. Worldwide, hundreds of thousands of vehicles, bullets, traps, and personnel are used to kill predators, whether out of hatred or to earn money. Almost every large predator in the world, world is losing ground to humanity. Despite the fact wolves in the lower 40s have regained less than 5% of their natural range, people are treating them as if they are far more common than they used to be, and they are trying to slaughter them again, as seen in the recent case where the profanities pack in Oregon was killed off. Sharks are being killed at a rate of 11,417 every hour, with no sign of this slowing down anytime soon. And there are even some animal rights activists and philosophers who believe that killing all predators or facing, forcing them to survive on nothing but plants is a better option than protecting them. They see conservation as increasing the net amount of suffering because they think ecosystems are evil. They believe animals are better off dead and not suffering than as part of functioning ecosystems. The abolitionist project headed by David Pierce in particular, seeks to eliminate all predators in the name of reducing sources of pain. But would that really reduce the amount of suffering that happens? Or, as we have seen, would that actually increase the amount of suffering? More importantly, is it really justified? Is suffering the only moral concern that matters here? I don't think so. If you lose the monsters that once ruled this world, we might lose more than the ecosystems they live in. We might lose a part of ourselves. Think about these questions. How many of the great thinkers of, the human, hi of human history have experienced the natural world? How strong is the natural world in human sight? And most importantly, what does it mean for humans if we cause the destruction of the very forces that led to us existing in the first place? But there are ways we can help, so we never have to worry about these questions ever. The following organizations up on the screen are some organizations that are working specifically for predator conservation. Predator Defense, Predator Conservation, and People and Carnivores are three organizations working in North America to reduce predator persecution and stop anti-predator legislation. And for fans of marine carnivores, there is Shark Savers and National Geographic's Pristine Seas Project. And remember, what, is, what most people perceive as negative or evil, what is vilified by many, is often the exact opposite in its effect. The great paradox of the predators is that they enrich life, not only because they help ecosystems, but because of their spiritual value. I personally miss the fact that wolves and mountain lions used to be found right here in Niagara, and I'm guessing that many in this audience will probably agree with me. Life isn't about avoiding suffering. Life is about experiencing diversity and being connected to the rest of the world. So let's all recognize just how much the so-called villains of our world really matter. Let's do everything in our power to restore, resurrect them to full glory. Thank you.